you know, this part, as I believe, 74 mitzvot, and I could be off by one or two, I believe it's 74 mitzvot, the most commandments of any portion. Most commandments, oh, uh, good day, Seth, a good day to you. So we're going to start with the fourth aliyah, and it says, Lo titaev adomi ki achichahu. And lo titaev mitzri ki gerayita baratso. It says, do not despise an Edomite because he's your brother. Do not despise an Egyptian because you are guests in his lands, because you are far in his lands. <laughs> so what a beautiful pasuk. I mean, that you can't hate an Egyptian because you were a stranger in his land. Hello, we were slaves there. But let's see what Rashi says. Go to Tevadomi Ligamri. Uh, uh, meaning to say completely. Meaning to say, even though, meaning do not completely uh, uh, despise him. Even though it's appropriate to despise him, even though it's appropriate to despise him because he went out to greet you with the sword. That's in, in Midbar chapter 20, 18 through 20. That's when we tried to go through their land and they went out to greet us. But at the end of the day, he's your brother. Even though he's your enemy, he's your brother. Don't despise him. And do not despise an Egyptian, Mikol Vakol, completely. Or even though they threw your males into the river, you're still not supposed to despise them. Matam, so hayu sanya because when there was a time of need, when Jacob was starving, he went down there and they helped you. So even though they did some bad, we have to, they did a lot of bad, we have to, we have to remember this and remember the good that they did. This contradicts Arashi and Shmos that we learned that said that we aren't supposed to ever live there or go there or... But we had this in... Uh, Last week's portion, you're not allowed to return to Egypt. That was last week's portion. Right? The king's not allowed to bring you back to Egypt. And also, this next verse says that they're not allowed to marry in until the third generation. So, it's what it's saying is you shouldn't have complete hatred in your heart for them. That there, that's what Rashi says. Legamri or Mikolva Kol. You can't have, they're not like Amalek, but you have to destroy. That there is a little bit more nuance here, that they did some good for you, even though. They obviously did a lot of terrible things for you. That they, they enslaved you. They threw Rashi doesn't even say enslaved. They threw your males into the river. But we still have to find something. We still have something to be grateful to. But it's it's obviously complicated because because they tried to kill us. <laughs> they did kill us. They did kill us. A lot of people ask me questions. I just had this question last week. Somebody asked me if he could go to a German folk festival. He asked me that question if it was appropriate. So it's uh, it's hard because the Germans today are clearly not the same people who they're not they're not responsible for what their parents did. But it's still it's the cause. They're not the same people who did it. No. They're, they're their children or grandchildren. Right. Although once the little puppies started flying over Israel, the Israeli Air Force. Yeah, no, so I'm just saying it's it's my experiences over again having the money to have it. Yeah. At uh, at customs, this guy is young. He thinks he doesn't have any uh chip on his shoulder anyway. He looks up, he sees me, he sees my star, there's a frown on his face. I go, I went around Berlin on the uh in China. It's beautiful little metro. Yeah. Uh, I keep running into people that they see me and they see this and suddenly cry. I'm walking across uh, in Berlin, that, what do you call it, plots in the big I know, uh, I've never been there. This girl is walking by with this a pro Palestinian flag. She's about 10 years old and she's got a sign as big as she is. And uh, the hatred is everywhere. And they wouldn't let me go into the shul to dog the Israeli soldiers at the front door. Under no circumstances, it wouldn't even tell me what time they call us. 
we yeah. have to register. Yeah. That's not the judge. Yeah. That's that's not their that's not the Germans' fault. That's no, the security it's, it's measures. For, it's because of oh, because of the security. They have to be so but that's all over Europe. All right, but then, but, but anyways. So <laughs> Where we have, oh, we have no problem. Where, yes, we have friends who go and shop us where you just go. Well, you know where I felt no no danger wearing a kippah? Saudi Arabia. Seriously. Anyway, and next verse. When they have children, the third generation, you're allowed to marry them. They can come into the community. Meaning, say, if an Egyptian converts... First generation, second generation, you're not allowed to marry them, even though they're Jewish. Only in the third generation. Does that mean they, when, when an Egyptian man would convert, does that mean he can only marry an Egyptian woman who converts? Because yeah, the Jewish woman exactly. Okay, exactly. So you need double conversions, three generations down. Not only. You need double conversion, but they also have to marry two generations. Yeah, like if the Egyptian in the second generation married the Egyptian double, first generation, no, but yeah, you have to marry the downs, yeah. So now they, the next person... They, they didn't have Kahal Garim, like a, a, a mixture of all the different converts? You're saying he can marry somebody else who converted. Well, it's at the end of Kedushin, so we're not there yet, but... Uh, well, no, eventually they're going to say we everybody got confused. We're talking right, about so... in the theoretical world, they can't do it. In the theoretical, mm -hmm. in the theory, theory of the Bible, they're not allowed to marry. That's the point. And what Rashi says, but the other nations, the other nations, as soon as they convert, they can marry to the Jews. We see from here that one who causes the person to sin is harsher to him than the one who kills him. The one who kills him, kills him in this world. One who calls him to sin leads him out of this world and the world to come. Therefore, Adam Shekidma Bacharev, Adam went out of Israel with the sword, won it av. They did not become abhorred. Vikhay Mitzrayim Shetivum, they did not cause them, also Egypt to drown them. But Ammon and Moab, who caused them to sin, nit avu. They became abhorred. Because then the Ammonites and the Moabites are never allowed to marry in. What did the Ammonites and the Moabites do? They're the ones who caused them to sin with the adultery. So therefore, causing somebody to sin is worse than killing them. Because when you cause them to sin spiritually, that's a multi-generational uh, white. But Steinbold says it doesn't apply to the women because obviously with David, right. they, uh, oh, right. the lineage. Oh, with Ammonites and Moabites, it, didn't, it doesn't apply to the, even though the, the adulterers were them. Yes, but the Ammonites and Moabites, it doesn't apply to the women. But with the Egyptians, it does. You know, I want to marry an Egyptian woman who converts either. Right. So, yeah, that's you see, we skipped the previous verse, which is talking about the Ammonites and the Moabites. And that's what happened when we start with the fourth Aliyah. Now, this is for you, Steve. Military policy. When the when the uh, camp, when you go out for a battle as a camp. On your enemy, you need to guard yourself from everything bad. Why? She says, At a time of danger, the prosecutor, the accuser is prosecuting. It's a very dangerous time. So therefore, there's a man who has an admission and he's not ritually pure, he has to go outside of the camp. He's not allowed to come into the camp. The, the camp needs to be spiritually pure. And this is necessary 
when you go out to fight your enemies. So if there's a person in the camp who has a, this is stricter than the regular, than the rest of the time. The rest of the time, if a man has a nocturnal omission, he's allowed to remain in Jerusalem. He can't go on the Temple Mount, but he's allowed to remain in Jerusalem. When you go to battle, he has to leave the camp. Rashi says, Dabra Kosov Gehovah. The verse speaks about that which is common. Meaning to say, even if the mission is during the day, he also has to leave. It's just that they spoke about the more common circumstance. I mean, in practical reality, I understand why they want to keep the camp holy, but this seems like it would be a bit of a push up uh, for the person to have the, the mission to have to have to leave the camp. And it's like, it's just so commonplace that it was like, you know, very little respect to privacy is at one point. I don't know if anybody comments about that. Um, well, there are other reasons why you'd have to go out. It's just not the only well, reason. It's, none of them are, all of them have to do with purity levels and different reasons. And, you know, at a certain age, you know, that, uh, whatever, a boy should have to be right. put outside. I'm just saying there's another side to it. It seems like, you know, to maintain that holiness, you're, you're also um, creating, you know, a, a potential embarrassment. That's true. The also compromising older security if you need to go that day. Wow. Right. But the point is, I think that what the Torah believes is that the, the military strength comes from their spiritual strength. Now, probably the U.S. Army might not agree with this specific law, but the idea that, that a military is as strong as its, as its, as its uh, belief in its mission that is that is for sure, I think, something that the generals would agree with, that if the army doesn't believe in its mission, it's not going to be as strong a force. What do you say about that, Steve? Right. There we go. Steve agrees with me. Yeah, you have to. The strength of a military is not only its F-16s. It's also the... the, the Israel always talks about we have the most moral fighting force and aggression. Part of we have to believe in that. We have to believe that, that that's the strength. That's um, that's um, one of the reasons. Like uh, when well, Russia has all these mercenaries working for it, so that's uh, that's uh, weakness. So what does Rashi say? The odds on the chutz and I goes outside the camp. Judy, you're trying to say something? Yeah, just look at the Vietnam War. You know, with the sticks and the harpoons, they beat us. Who beat us? The Vietnamese, their willpower beat us and France. Yeah. Were you in Vietnam, Judah? You weren't in Vietnam. Uh, I don't know. No, I will. You're not. too young. You're too young, I think, to be in Vietnam, right? Uh, no, I came, my, my number was 61, but they went on oh. up to 39. So, oh, you were in the draft. You were in the draft. Yeah, wow. in the draft. I didn't realize that. You didn't go, Steve. You didn't go to Vietnam, did you? I went twice. Oh, you Not went as to a Oh, as no. uh, like an analyst or no, Pentagon? Foreign relations. Uh, so, so it's yeah. still intense. I'm sure it's very intense, even though you're not in the military. I'm sure it's very intense. When they're shooting, they don't ask you. <laughs> the, the difference was you didn't have a gun. Did you have a gun when you no, went? I didn't wear one. Wow. Yeah. Not there, there. I, I did in Iran. Not to, not wow, intense. There was a man here, uh, George Johnson, of blessed memory. We were still in his year of mourning. He went to Vietnam and he was a uh, uh, intelligence officer. And many years later, I was studying with him. He wrote a beautiful essay about his time there as Jewish. But he said he, they, had this, they had these trips where you could go back and and meet the people who you were fighting against. So he met his counterpart, uh, who was the intelligence officer in the in the Viet, Viet Cong in the uh, area that he was fighting. And his job was George's job when he was sent was to find the headquarters of the Vietnamese who were attacking the the U.S. Army base. They never found it. He was there, and they never found it. And then when he went back, they showed him where on the ground. They what showed happened? him where where the Vietnamese group was. You know where it was? 
they built the army base right on top of the Vietnamese camp. So that's how they that's how they got in there. They built it right on top of them. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So okay. So then the verse states, Rashi says, it's a positive commandment. You cannot come into the camp. There's a negative commandment. You're not allowed to go into the Levite camp, which in today in the temple is the Temple Mount. For sure, in the divine camp. And this is relevant today. A lot of times people ask me, am I allowed to go up on the Temple Mount? Today and the answer is you could go on the Temple Mount today, as long as if you're a man you can go on the Temple Mount as long as you first go to the mikvah. Women could also go on the Temple Mount as long as they first go to the mikvah. The problem is, for women, the custom is not to go to the mikvah unless you're married. And married, the custom is not to go because you've been with your husband. You're only supposed to go. There we go into what Seth was saying about the uh, privacy issues. You're only supposed to go when you're um, at the beginning of your transition period from from menstruation, which is why, because of the point Seth raised, the men who go to the mikvah in Israel or in America, they have the custom to go every single day. So you can't tell when they had the mission. They're going every single day, so to avoid that type of uh, that type of that type of um, so lack of privacy. That type of lack of privacy. Nobody needs to know when you had an omission. So you go every single day. But as long as you, but so for women, it became the custom. Those women who go, they go, since they go to the mikvah a few days before they got married. So then they go, a lot of women go to the mikvah in between, uh, go to the Temple Mount, in between going to the mikvah and those few days before they get married, they say a special prayer before they go to the chukah. So now the verse states, Vayolif knows Erev and so he goes outside the camp, and then towards the evening, he goes and he goes into the mikvah. He washes the water. And when the sun sets, he comes back to the camp. Rashi says, "Some of our shimshel." He goes close to the setting of the sun. Yitbol sheino tower below a hair of shemesh. Even though he immerses, he's still not purified until. The sun sets. And now we have another thing. As it states, And now he says he has to have a yad. What's a yad? Rashi says this means guitar gumo means a prepared place, means to you have to have a, uh, a toilet, you have to go, you have to go outside the camp, a prepared place, and that's where you go. Rashi says, outside the cloud. Means to say, if you have to go outside the place, there's a specific place. You need to have a shovel. <coughs> Excuse me. You need to have a shovel in addition to your weapon. You have a weapon and a shovel. You have a shift of so when you sit outside and you dig. So you need to dig a hole and cover over your excrement. This is the law that when you have to go to the bathroom, you have to go with dignity. Not like San Francisco. I don't know, is that what they just go in the middle of the street there? Right. Well, well, the point is, I wonder how, how this, how this, um, how this is uh, tracks with the other nations who were fighting in their armies at that time. They also required a shovel. Oh, yes. Oh, right. yes. Well, that's the reason, not the research, is that the, the, the other guys were snow. 
Yeah, but this is outside the camp anyway. You're not in the camp. But you were asking whether people do that. Presumably, yes, because everybody wants the same thing. Yeah, but they have to have a shovel. Yeah, oh, also, the carry the trenching tool. All right, all right, all right. Revive me, Sharkat. Yeah, yeah, Rabbi Yosef. Just uh, like there's a story in the Gemara. I don't remember where about this man that was walking on a path, and uh, he was telling the person that was walking with him about the people that are in front of them, and he was saying that. Uh, one of them is a goy because he was uh, peeing right on the road as opposed to uh, going aside. So um, I, I guess, you know, even even if it is something that is autumn, like Rashi tells us in Parsha Mishpatim, that even if something makes absolute sense, Hashem gives it to us as a mitzvah because that way we, we merit more mitzvahs, right? So. so it's a mitzvah. So here you have a mitzvah to cover yourself when you go, when you go to the bathroom to cover your excrement. Well, it's also it stops disease spreading. Yeah, they understood that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that kills a lot of people is when you spread the disease when you're in a battle. So then, um, so well, then, even in your own camp, in your own camp, I'm saying you spread the disease. Yeah. So, well, she says. That you do this as a nef comes from the term for weapon, and then verse 15 God, Hashem, your God is in your camp. Hashem is in your camp to save you and to put your enemy in front of you. Your camp has to be holy. So you should not have. Erva here means shameful thing and turn away. You have to have your camp with dignity. Even like there's the soldiers have to be carrying themselves with the recognition that they're in a holy camp. It said Hutzla, not outside the cloud. Yeah. So what cloud are we talking about? The there's cloud. No clouds that are following us. No, Raj, she says here to, in the wilderness, the, the area was protected by the cloud. The yeah, I thought we would. I thought we. I thought that was that ended. No, it ended when Aaron died. Okay. So, Isn't this technically after that? Yeah, so I guess this was a commandment that was given before Aaron died. Uh huh. So it stayed. Oh, okay. this. Oh, by the way. Oh, Seth. The footnote here asks Seth's question, and it's from the Moscow of David. He says, although Moses was speaking after the death of Aaron, at which time the clouds of glory departed, see Rashi to Numbers 21.1, the Gemara in Tanis 9a says that they subsequently returned through the merit of Moses. So very good. Very, very strong, Seth. Very strong. Very strong question. Right. Don't you feel good when you ask the question that they ask? It makes yeah. you feel like... It's like we're having a decent... Um, we're talking to the right people. Yeah, it makes you feel like you still got it. You still got it. <laughs> so then, what does the verse say? Oh, this is a very, you ever hear of the Dred Scott law? This is related to that. If a slave runs to you from his master, do not return him to his master. Do not return a slave to his master if he runs to you from his master. Rashi says, Kitar Gumo. Rashi quotes the Targum that this refers to a Canaanite slave that runs away to you, runs to you from his Canaanite master. You're not allowed to return him back to his Canaanite master. The Varachar, a few ever Kenani Shal Yisrael, Shabarach and Chutzlaretz Eretz Yisrael. We had this recently in Gittin. Now let's say there was a Canaanite slave who runs away from outside the land of Israel. He's a slave to a Jew, but he runs to Israel. To, then you're not allowed to enslave him anymore. So we see from here that, that if the slave is desiring a higher spiritual level, you cannot send him back. With you he shall dwell in your midst in the place that he, that he has chosen for you in one of your gates. 
do not taunt him. Okay, okay. I think it's time to dive in, but what a beautiful uh, yeah. teaching. Shekoyach, yeah. shekoyach. Let us let us dive in. Beautiful. What'd you say? 